Hello. <laughs> if you would uh, like to keep eating, if you haven't finished yet, please do so. If you'd like to kind of switch your chairs around a little bit so you can uh, face the screen up here, uh, <laughs> you'll have some uh, nice things to look at. I'd like to uh, introduce to you uh, our speaker, uh, Dr. Greg Stuns. Greg is a uh, professor at Texas A&M University Corpus Christi, uh, but more important to us here today and, and with me, he's an endowed chair of fisheries and ocean health at the Heart Research Institute at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. And, you know, kind of personally, he's kind of a quiet and shy guy, but I encourage you to go to his website. Uh, and that's where he kind of gets the label as our rock star with uh, the students and other scientists, uh, National Geographic, New York Times, uh, other people have taken note of his really neat uh, blend of technology and going fishing to work. And so I think you'll uh, really enjoy the uh, interesting things that he's doing and discovering and helping out in learning about the science of the South Texas coast. Greg. Thank you everyone for having me for your lunch speaker. And I don't know about the rock star thing. <laughs> they say that's not, that's not it at all. But um, anyway, when, when Wes, uh, I'm gonna have a hard time standing behind this microphone, I can already tell you. Um, when Wes asked me to, I'm not a coral reef ecologist or biologist. Um, I'm a fish ecologist. When Wes said, you know, come talk to you guys, I'm like, well, you, know, you sure you want me to hear about that? You know, they want to hear about fishes. But actually, there's some relevant and related things going on in the Gulf, I'm sure most of you are aware of, you know, that we, it's really taken the, the top part of our research program. And so I'll tell you a little bit about that today. In fact, that's the video you see going. That's 712 rig right off of Corpus Christi, if you're, you might be familiar with it. It's a, a, a reef that was rigged in the Rigs to Reef program. Um, that's uh, obviously the fish don't like it, right? <laughs> so, tons of fish there. That's the deck of the platform that was cut off and laid down beside it. And obviously there's, there's a lot of snapper and other things that are using these. But before I get into to all that, um, I probably should give you a little background. So um, we're fish ecologists. We, we care about sustainable fisheries. I mean, fisheries are renewable resource in the sense if we don't fish down into our principle too much, um, they'll constantly be replenishing themselves for us. And of course, obviously knowing where that level is requires a lot of science and that's what my group does. We spend a lot of time working on sport fish because we, we do take a hard time about fishing, but you know, I was like, I finally put all that education to use to you know, do something really fun. But, but we incorporate that into our program. But um, anyway, we work, obviously, reef fish and red snapper drive our program, but we study all pelagics. We, we, the technology we have today is pretty much unbelievable. We can put all kind of neat little electronic tags in these fish and track them globally, and they'll email us that information to our iPhones in our pocket of where they've been, so it's pretty cool. And In fact, we're employing some of that technology in our rig um, work. But um, let's see if I can find the laser pointer here. But the latest thing going is obviously these artificial structures and what do they mean to fisheries in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, before I get too far, and I don't want to bore you with a bunch of legal things, but there's recent reauthorization of our governing uh, laws that govern fisheries in the Gulf, primarily the, the Magnuson Act, or what we call the Sustainable Fisheries Act, that was recognizing that what's really a threat um, to the fisheries in the Gulf and, and uh, you know, U.S. nationwide is loss of habitat. And so the big deals here is the greatest long-term threats are loss of habitat, estuarine, marine, and, and other aquatic things like wetlands and marshes and such. And stemming out of that is something we pretty much funds most of our program is this concept called EFH, or it's called essential fish habitat. And you can think of that as that's the nursery, that's what the fish need to survive. And it's, of course, another long federal definition, but it's things like the waters, the substrates, that's obviously key here in terms of um, uh, most many marine fish are habitat limited um, that are necessary for spawn spawning, breeding, How growth, and maturity. You can see those kind of things that keep us sustainable. We those kind of approach if it doesn't happen at little small fish, you're not going to have the big fish and that's all about um, EFH. And so when you, we had a lot of projects and, and work early on and um, 
we were looking at, well, what is essential fish habitat? And as an ecologist, pretty soon you begin to say, well, you know what? Snowflakes in the Rocky Mountains are essential fish habitat to red snapper because that fresh water's got to get to the bays, that productivity's got to get to the ocean. So this essential fish habitat thing isn't helping us out at all. And so a colleague of mine wrote a paper and we said we need to identify essential, essential fish habitat. The funny thing, people come up to me still all the time and say, did y'all realize in that paper you put the word essential two times? And I thought, okay, clearly you didn't read it because that's not what we meant what we meant is that you there's not enough resources or time or resources available to protect everything I mean we got to pick out the flower gardens we got to pick out the hard banks we got to pick out the structures and save them first we just heard that similar thing going on in the, the core of um, bleaching and acidification talk and prioritize and, and make those important and so one of those is obviously some of these oil and gas platforms that are in the Gulf and their associated um, artificial reefs and so um, that's them. You guys probably recognize that. Um, we spend a lot of time under the water and in ROVs and other things doing fish assessments and other ecological studies on, on these reefs. And so what's interesting about these is that, that that's, the Gulf of Mexico looks generally like this. In fact, this is some, from some of our ROV work where that's going to be a new artificial reef site. We're doing a bunch of pre-work. And it's mud bottom. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of important ecological things happening on mud bottom. But in terms of uh, ecological productivity and other things, structured habitats are really where it's at. And they're just lacking in the Gulf of Mexico for the most part. And um, so the mud bottom predominates. Um, it, it, if you looked at the hard structures in the Gulf, and we see similar slides of this um, all along today, um, obviously, you know, Florida on the, the east and west coast are not too short of hard bottom. But as you go out to our areas, particularly in the western Gulf, there's just not much of it. And you, you, you guys are well aware of what's going on with that. But it's, it's not all bad news. But if you looked at fisheries productivity, reef fish in particular, are typically limited in terms of the, the amount their populations can grow or limited by the amount of hard structure or habitat that's available out there. So as you get out this way, there's just um, less and less. But we've got these things in the water that have been put in. You know, we talk about it, early on there was environmental concerns about putting them in. Now there's environmental concerns about taking them out. I mean, this, this one in particular is High Island 389. It's a biggie that you never know from day to day if this one's staying or going, but it's part of the, part of the decommissioning um, process that's sitting out there. And so a lot of controversy surrounding this particular rigs, but in general, a lot of them. So there's really, this is all the artificial reefs in the Gulf, and there are really two types. Some we put there because we want them as artificial reefs, things like concrete pilings, bridge pilings, or a whole variety of even tires and other things. And um, Alabama has a big reefing program, that's why you see all the red out there. But um, uh, the other type, of course, is oil and gas platforms that are represented here. But as you'll see in this next slide, these are actually the, the platforms. It makes up most of that. Uh, if you get rid of the, the Alabama part, there, there's a lot of them, and th this number is very hard to pin it down, but 3,000 upper threes is a good, good number of how many are really out there. Um, but same thing as you get over to our side of the Gulf and the Western Gulf, there's very few. So if you th said, well, these, these are coming out quickly, may not be such a big deal off of Louisiana, but just a few off the Texas coast could make a big deal if these are actually important to sustaining these populations. So I uh, spent a lot of time with my group trying to create this graph, and getting the numbers of installation removal is not at all easy. I mean, it changes daily, it seems like, and even on the web pages we go to, it's, it's not quite there. But the point here is not so much the numbers, the point is the trends. So if you looked at, they first went in in the 40s. I mean, obviously, it, there was a lot of them being put in. So the red is the installation. Obviously, we've seen a dramatic drop there. And um, this is the, the um, ones that are being removed. So obviously, in science, we often don't like to see interactions where things cross, and that's exactly what's happening, is we're seeing a lot more removed than are putting in, and that is some cause for concern if there is um, um, some ecological benefit of these structures in the Gulf. So here's a real tabular form. Um, in 2010, 3,400, 23 new ones were put in, 160 removed, obviously not the trend, specifically over in Texas this year, because um, they're being disassembled as we speak. There's about 288 existing, um, six going in, and 29 that are scheduled to be removed. So um, um, you might ask, okay, well, what's, what's really driving um, that trend? 
And uh, b- before I go there, one other thing, so just to give you some general facts, um, about 3,800 to 8,000 square meters per structure is, is what these uh, rigs can provide. Of course, they're all different sizes and shapes, so um, you know, that's, that's a lot of habitat. Um, and not only that, it creates habitat on the seafloor, but all the way up through the water column as well, and you'll see why that's important in a minute. Um, this increase the Gulf Reef hard bottom habitat by, depending on which uh, paper you want to read, um, 1.3 and how you count it to about 2%, but that's quite a bit. And as I pointed out earlier, not all of these areas are equal in terms of where these structures occur across the Gulf. So you might know, I mean, we've seen more slides of this. This was sort of, you know, what, what I say is everyone sort of blames this rapid removal on the deep water horizon, which certainly didn't slow down the process, but this was happening um, all along. You know, you had several storms. This was Rita coming along and obviously others that followed it. And um, you had these structures that were out there that weren't necessarily producing. They were slated for decommissioning, but sitting there and there was some damage and other things. So um, for liability concerns, primarily the oil and gas companies wanted to remove them. But what really happened after this is um, the administration said, well, we really need to do something because obviously we don't want something like this to obviously happen again. And, it, and this idle iron policy came out and essentially what it said is you've got five years to get them out. Once they're beyond their definition of production, you need to remove them. Um, typically they're removed below the mud line and restored the bottom to its natural state. So you remove any type of productivity that might have occurred below the surface here. Um, there's about 813 now, and that's a, that's a moving target as well as, as, as what's you know, considered idle iron in the Gulf of Mexico or non-producing uh, oil and gas wells. And 156 are slated to, to uh, come out this year. So you might be wondering, so where's the controversy? And like any good argument, there's the, there's the good and the bad, and, and they actually overlap. I mean, obviously there's a habitat value, there's ecological functions, there are popular destinations. Pretty much all dive trips head out to, uh, even when you go to the flower gardens, you, you hit 389 and some of those other um, rigs. People's livelihoods depend upon that, commercial fishermen, recreational fishermen, and charter captains, for example. There's strong arguments that they actually help fisheries. That means they don't just attract fisheries, to them, they actually produce more fish than would be there if they weren't there, um, as well as other economic factors and other socioeconomic uh, things that are there, whole, even migratory birds and, and things like that. Of course, the other side uh, really says, well, number one, it's, it's the law and our policy. We gotta remove them, we don't have a choice. I mean, that's the current state. In fact, there's a lot of legislation um, up for consideration now to, to, to slow this down a little bit. The other big deal is liability. I mean, that for shipping and navigation and, and boaters and anglers tie up to these. So there's obviously a, a great risk of exposure to the companies that have these out there. There's some groups that just say, well, it's not actually creating reef. You're flat out ocean dumping. There's an article we did not too long ago and some guy wrote a comment. Well, if you throw a grocery basket in an urban stream, I'm sure minnows would go to it, but it's still trash. <laughs> so. You know, that's the, but that's the whole range of uh, arguments we hear. Obviously, this navigation thing, um, they often contend that, in fact, um, the, the part of the attraction issue, it's actually hurting fisheries. You don't have any more fisheries. In other words, there's no production. It's just fish are aggregated. I mean, it's a no-brainer fish-like structure. So fish are clearly aggregated to these structures, and you just make it easier for them to be exploited by um, fishing and things. So um, anyway, obviously there's the whole economic side. Um, a lot of uh, industry is sparked up in the decommissioning process. And so um, just like the fishermen say it's my livelihood, well, there's other groups that have developed their businesses around decommissioning. So very, very politically and controversial um, subject. But that didn't, we're scientists. You know, we try to put that, put that aside to, to give you an example of what one of these looks like. If this was the rig, the, several things or versions of these can happen. Um, typically, they can't be reefed in place. They have to go to permitted reefing areas because of federal regulations. But if they happen to be in one, um, they, they're, they're cut off and they can uh, be towed and relocated to a reefing area. Um, they might be toppled in place. Sometimes they're cut, like the video you saw today, it was cut and actually just placed next to it like this cutoff one. And of course, there's all type of heavy duty equipment that does that. But obviously, if you move 389 with the corals inshore, there's probably some implications of, of that removal. In addition, um, high explosives are typically used in this removal process, and it results in things like that. And there's been a lot, uh, clearly fish die if they're close to it. The shock waves from the explosion pretty much, you know, get rid of things very, well, even meters out from the, the rig. 
But um, the issue since a lot of work was done by the federal government is the dynamics in the red snapper fishery have changed greatly. It's, it's recovering. There's a lot bigger fish. There's a lot more of them. So the numbers we might have used in the past of how many red snapper would die on one particular explosion are probably much greater. And there's also a lot more biomass because they're bigger. So that's another um, issue that, that particularly the private recreational anglers care about as well. So. Um, so anyway, we've been working closely. The, the Parks and Wildlife here has very strong artificial reef, probably one of the biggest in the Gulf. Louisiana has another uh, big one. Their, their main uh, ideas are obviously rigs to reef. There's also just regular reefing, and then something called ship to, ships to reefs. That's the clipper that was down at A&M Galveston that was reefed off of South Padre Island. But um, they've recognized the value of this in reefing reefs inshore, uh, well, inshore meaning within uh, state waters and out in federal waters as well. And we've been working closely with them to monitor monitor and, and, and understand the, the functions of, of these particular reefs. So that's where our group comes in. I was telling about the technology. Obviously, we dive. Um, one of the, the regulations I should have probably pointed out is when you, when you cut one of these rigs off, you have to, it has to give ships clearance to go over it, obviously, to avoid a navigational hazard. And that prevents a lot of diving on these rigs because you're right at some of really safe diving depths of about 90 feet. You can't, you know, down here, it's obviously much, much deeper and well beyond what our university regulations require. So we have all kind of new technology, little robots and subs that we can send down below the, below the diving depth. And um, so, so what are we doing? Well, we're partnering specifically to monitor these artificial reef sites that have been reefed, but many times they've never even been visited. We're not even sure if some of them, for example, don't exist anymore. They've been silted over or covered up. Um, we use ROV and diver surveys, and we also use fisheries gear as well because we are fisheries ecologists, and what's funding and driving this is their fisheries um, productivity. We look at cutoff, topple platforms, and standing structures, what material, what distance from shore. Pretty much if there's a question there, we're, we're asking it as well as new reefing sites and not yet built. Um, one controversial subject that's involved in this is that so you have this reef sticking above the water. If you talk to any ecologist, clearly there's a photic zone where the sunlight's coming in. A lot of productivity happens at this water surface. And there's some evidence that that productivity is translated down to these bottom structures. So when you cut the rigs off, you might be in hindering some of that um, productivity. So there's a lot of uh, groups, Save the Blue, for example, um, out of here wants to leave these in place. And in fact, they've developed some creative ways to uh, set up trust and lighting and maintenance and all kind of things and the money they would save to remove it to put back into a trust and so anyway a lot of lot of activities in this realm but we really don't have the the, the firm science and I'll show you a little bit of our preliminary work of you know do, does it make a big difference if you um, cut it off or leave it standing the short answer is it does um, this uh, these are our micro subs um, they, they're called ROVs or remotely operated vehicles or, and um, fish love them. They're very, very curious. That's it. I mean, it's bread basket size. People can't believe we just chunk it in the water and it zips off. It's actually tethered. You can't see the tether. You can barely see it here, but it's tethered to the boat. It can go down way beyond diving depths. We strap on GoPros. It carries a payload and mi mi can you say it? manipulator arms and all the, all the goodies and, and um, that kind of thing. And so uh, if you're interested, I won't really spend any time on this slide, but this is Corpus Christi Bay and, and Port Aransas where we typically go out of. These are the air, uh, reefs that we're actually uh, monitoring. If you were here earlier, you heard West Tunnel, the uh, RV Falcor will be in. We'll be on it for almost two weeks at sea um, in about a month or so, hitting all of these, doing multi-beam mapping and hopefully some side scan as well as all of our fisheries um, work on those as well. Um, so anyway, you know, we are, we're talking about these questions, you know, so is there a seasonal use to these rigs? Um, you know, the first question obviously is just what's using them. We just don't know. And, and obviously driven by a lot of sport fish or fish of economically important. We talked already about distance to shore, water depth. A lot of work in the Gulf of Mexico now deals with connectivity. We just heard the talk about how flower gardens are much larger than we think. It was really sort of one system. And connectivity issues and how animals disperse throughout the um, um, their home range is a very relevant um, ecological issue. You know, lionfish is a good example where this might actually work in the opposite direction. But um, the big deal here, obviously, we talked about toppled and cutoff. Is this attraction um, versus production? You can't hardly have a talk without going going there. But I'm basically going to say, you know, that probably in really should really be going because you know we can we can do a lot of things. And I'll show you a slide in a second on attraction versus productions. I think there's some better ways to, to get at this. But as we start um, doing this, you know, we we are well aware of the coral reef sampling. You put out transects and you do point count 
methods. There's, it's well grounded in the scientific literature. That kind of falls apart when you start beginning to sample some of these rigs. Um, so we're up at the surface, obviously. It's cut off pretty much beyond diving depth. We don't know what would have happened here, but we do still sample it. And by the way, we sample rigs that are still standing for comparison purposes, but for as far as our diving, um, we're, we're limited, you know, pretty much where they're the top of the reef and above. But we send our ROV down every few meters and we do basically spin in circles, just like a point count method, if you're familiar with it. But the problem is you confound your um, study with depth because these are vertical structures rather than a nice, relatively flat um, coral reef. Um, strong currents, half the time we can't find the structure, so we got a really nice uh, sonar that we put on there to guide it. You know, you imagine this is, you know, 100 feet below the surface in rough seas. We talked about the nephloid layer, so basically that's the false bottom. It turns out snapper love to hide in there, so visually we have some problems assessing them in the deeper water. And then, you know, just currents and, and other things are issued. But the whole purpose of the year, one of the study was to solve these and come up with what's the most acceptable means to actually um, scientifically validate these and collect good quantifiable data we could um, stand on. And so um, we were talking about clarity. That's it. You know, so you can see one snapper above it. That's the false bottom. This is only about 30 feet up here it's crystal clear and as you get in this layer you know it just sort of turns to fog and disappears sometimes it's very distinct and then sometimes it's just sort of like a layer of fog as you descend into and there's a lot of fish down here that you you would miss and we know that um, because when you drop a hook down there we catch them and so we are working with others across the gulf of mexico and there's a whole vertical long line and of course long lines are big issues but these are scientific long lines they're basically like a straight up and down trot line if you know what it is a big weight with a bunch of hooks and we put randomly put different hook sizes in all the same bait and we drop it down and do a fisheries independent survey. And this is going on across the Gulf to actually look at some, if you're into fisheries, you know about catch pre unit effort. It's some monitoring terms that we use to tell how good or not these structures um, happen to be. So that's what happens when we can't see anything. And many times if the currents are bad or just the visibility is so low, you can't see what's out there. That's actually it. It's just a, a, on a big reel and you drop it down and pull the fish up. Same, pretty much fishing on the, on a, vertical line. And so um, anyway, I, I don't know that I'm willing to go out on a limb and really talk about, you know, some of our results because this was the initial phase, but, but um, I'll give you sort of a, a few of the punch lines and then in the next few months we'll have a much more concrete data. But, you know, it's a no-brainer. Fish like these things. We knew that all along. It's the, where the controversy is. The fishermen wouldn't care if the fish didn't like it, but there's a lot of fish on these things. They're um, um, very important to a variety of species in terms of uh, fish use. Um, there, it, it doesn't seem to matter what kind of structure it is, whether it's concrete, if it's a Liberty ship, whether it's a toppled rig, if they're below the surface, that we pretty much see the same abundance trends. Of course, the more habitat there is, the more fish, but if you weight that, we pretty much see, see similar um, abundance. But what's interesting is we don't see it. We see very, very different densities and communities and species richness and all these terms we use in biology um, of these standing structures. For example, herbivorous fish are a lot more prevalent because they're eating things that photosynthesize. So there is probably some some real value to, to that photic zone. Now, whether it's translating down to the bottom productivity, well, that's still on our um, radar to begin to address, but at least from a survey standpoint, it's, it's definitely there. So um, uh, back to the sort of attraction versus production um, issue, um, this figure on the left, I mean, this is um, on uh, A12 that's out of Port Aransas. I mean, those are all red snapper, by the way. I mean, certainly. There's no question they, they use these areas, and there's a lot of them. You can actually see that nephloid layer. They're real curious when you go down, they come up out of the nephloid layer to figure out what's going on. Um, then, you know, so that's obviously they are, they're attracted there, but then do they produce? Do you have small fish like this? The, the sort of holy grail of the productivity is do you have young juveniles using it, and do they grow up and use that area? So we have all type of really neat new tagging mechanisms that we can look at residency time, and we have acoustic tags and, and things I'll tell you about in just a second. But the real question is that we all have to answer, is habitat limited for certain species in the Gulf? I'd make the argument that certainly it is, particularly for reef fish and red snapper. So that right away begins to say, okay, well, you know, there probably is some production going there, but 
our future studies will look at densities of juveniles, movement among these areas, our electronic tags, we can plop one in and, and listen for them as they move about um, throughout their home range. Um, and I'll show you some uh, in a slide in a second, but we're calling it the Texan, which is the Texas um, Acoustic Array Network. And we've already covered about 200 miles of Texas and we have plans to cover much as we can of the Gulf, much as the funding will allow, so we can have broad ranges of movements of not just fish, but sea turtles or anything that can carry um, our electronic tags. Um, we need to look at what's the source of these populations. Are they, are the fish spawning here providing the, are they going right back to their structure? We have a lot of neat scientific ways to get at that. And obviously growth is a big deal to, to get at this productivity issue. But I, I would sort of argue that aside, we're, we're, it, we can go out and there's plenty of studies that show there's production. There's plenty of studies show that there's attraction and maybe not production for a variety of species, very species specific. But I kind of think we need to get away from that argument and begin to look at, well, what's the real ecological role to that? And then, then also at the Institute, um, obviously we, you know, I never thought I'd work with people like Rich McLaughlin in terms of, you know, lawyers trading our marine scientists and marine biologists and David Yoskowitz is our economist and our socioeconomics. And we have a marine biology student looking at what's the real socioeconomic value of these structures. And um, that's really where I think we need to be going with it. This is the tech sand that I was telling you about. These are autonomous receivers. We used to call it wiring the coast, and everybody said, what about, how, where are all these wires going to go? I was like, there's no wires. They're autonomous. They're about the size of a tennis ball can. And they sit out and um, listen for these little tags that you surgically implant in a fish. And if it swims in good sea conditions about a half a mile from your receiver, it lets you know it. They even tell acceleration, depth, temperature, and pressure, and all kind of neat things. And so we have all these scattered out, a whole bunch of them on all the oil and gas platforms to look at what the movement and exchange is, is occurring in the fisheries. Red snapper is kind of our key species for doing that, and spotted sea trout in the bay too, by the way, but that's, that's a different story. Um, to give you just some brief, you know, we don't have any socioeconomic data, believe it or not. I mean, it's just not there. 99 study is the oldest, and certainly things have changed since then. But just to give you an idea, virtually 100% of the dive trips and half of the charter and party boat trips target these oil and gas platforms. So, I mean, there's, there's something there. I mean, and in, in that was in 99. Um, it, also in 99, overall in the Gulf, about a million fishing trips occurred, spending $173 million and another 640 in associated equipment to actually get out there and do it. I mean, it's obviously not cheap to get out there. And, and this willingness to pay in all these uh, economic terms that the economists like to talk about, users are willing to pay to use these platforms. So there's, there's certainly um, some, some economic value there. So um, the, David Yoskowitz and his crew are heavily um, working on this to update these numbers with what's the latest values in these areas. So what would I say, based upon what we know so far in blue, we're just scratching the tip of the iceberg in terms of this concept, because we got a lot, we're, we're just barely there. Um, the, the first thing, are there key structures? Should we leave 389 in place? Could it be seed stock for the coral? If something horrible was, you know, hopefully never would happen, but would, you know, are there, are there ones, the pinnacle ones that, you know, that, and by the way, the fishermen tell us certain ones do a lot better than others for just some variety of reason. And, um, you know, we need more time to understand regional issues. It's a big deal off the southern Texas coast because there's not many, maybe not such a big deal off Louisiana where there's the, the dynamics are very different. Obviously, you know, people think in dollar terms, if you can put a value on the value of every red snapper and oil and gas platform, you can make some, some uh, good arguments. Um, time's not on our side. Um, scientifically, you know, we, we, my fisheries classes, we preach, take a precautionary approach. You do the conservative thing. You don't move too fast. And so, you know, we should take this precautionary approach. We'd like to see a short-term halting to removing these, at least so we can get a better scientific understanding of, of what's going on. I think there's some political um, uh, uh, traction behind that as well. But I guess we'll, you know, you never know where that's, I don't expect to see anything before November. And so, um, anyway, that's, that's the, that's the short story. I'll show you a little video in a minute. I mean, obviously the Parks and Wildlife is, is driving the funding for this as well as some other interns and other things provided through the National Science Foundation. I'm usually giving talks and trying to find money to fund this. So these guys get to go out and have all the fun at the flower gardens and stuff. But I have a great team that actually gets to do all this fun stuff and, and, and really making, making it happen for us. And also the Schmidt Ocean Institute will provide this uh, unbelievable boat for us for nearly a month collectively in the Gulf of Mexico. So that, that'll be a big deal this summer. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. I'll just end with the, the video you can see.
These happen to be gray snapper. There's some red snapper mixed in there. And as you watch this video, you'll see back in the background, these fish are obviously very associated with the structure, but there's a whole host of other pelagics and other things swimming around in the distance. Um, and this is with our ROV, by the way. They aren't the least bit afraid of it. In fact, they're just the opposite, in fact, so. All right, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, great, great talk. Um, but I wanted to ask you about the snapper, about the gray snapper. Uh, yeah. How far offshore is that particular? That's uh, 34 miles. 34, 34 miles. 34. So mm -hmm. I, I just don't remember gray snapper being Me either. <laughs> anywhere in, uh, along the Texas coast, except uh, and obviously they're far out. So ha have you noticed if these are recruiting there as juveniles and growing up, or are they coming in as adults? or? We just don't, we just haven't been doing it enough to know, but that's on our list to look at juvenile recruitment to these areas. But as far as gray snapper, for example, a couple of weeks they were just out the flower guards. Well, Stetson Bank was loaded with gray snapper. Yeah. Larry McKinney, our director, was literally swimming through schools of them. So that's really unusual. We don't really know what is going on with that. And the other thing is not a lot of people have spent a lot of time on ROVs down there to really know is that normal or, or not. We're sort of thinking maybe not. So, um, but anyway, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't. Well, in Florida, we also call them mangrove snapper. Yeah. And they, yeah. that's a part of their, their life cycle, seagrasses yeah. and mangroves. And yeah. So th this is tremendous. Another whole connectivity issue of how they're getting out there as well. So. Yeah. Yes, I think she said they want you to use the microphone so they can hear you. Thank you. Uh, Greg, I know this is a fish talk, but I'm just curious if you're seeing any uh, coral growing on the bottom of these platforms that you're, oh, yeah, you're yeah. visiting, and, and, and if so, and apparently so, yeah. how much? How often? Well, we're, we, it depends on where you are, obviously. Our, our structures occur from literally just miles from the seashore all the way out to 70 or so miles. So, you know, for example, High Island 389 isn't in ours, but obviously there's corals there. And so they're, they're there. It just depends on which rig that you're on. A lot of soft corals too. Yep. Uh, yes, the platforms when they're active, they use cathodic protection, and the and the structures are electrically charged. Um, do the barnacles and corals and whatever do they fix better after they you know they're decommissioned and the charge is off or? Or does that enhance the early uh, development? That's a good question. I have no idea. <laughs> I do know when they put artificial structures in, you know, they foul and, and contaminate in a good way. I guess contaminate, you know, if you want to keep it clean is the issue. But from a fouling standpoint of, of starting the food chain, it happens very, very quickly. But as far as when you decommission them, what would happen? I don't know. I know part of the issue of um, leaving them in place is that what would happen over time or if it falls. And part of some of the discussion that I've heard is putting this cathodic protection remaining on them and is part of that. But that I'm way outside of my area of expertise on that. So, As, uh, as I understand it, this is a, a surface phenomenon. The, 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 the structure provides surface for recruitment is that what right surface okay. area and relief so right. so okay. generally it's flat and there's not a lot out there and yeah. fish just i mean they they're attracted to structure has anyone ever thought about designing rigs to increase the surface to volume ratio so that it would be more attractive well that's a good point i don't know that they no i don't i don't know i assume they're design you know for hurricane protection and that kind of thing but um but there's there's a lot of surface area on them and, and what we see it as well is many times it's i don't know it's so much the surface area it's just that a structure is there and we haven't got as far as you know does more certainly more structure means more fish in a large sense but you know ones that are equal we don't know you know there, there's a lot of fish on all of these i guess is what i'm saying I didn't see a hand going up. So one more quick question. Uh, in all of your, your research in the area, have you seen any sites that you would consider fish spawning aggregation sites? Well, until he's gray snapper. <laughs> um, but um, no, there, it's hard to tell you how many fish are really on. I mean, not hard to tell you. I can tell you there's a lot of them. Most people can't appreciate how many fish are actually on each one of these structures. So it, we don't see that, okay, well, all of a sudden, all the snapper on this particular, they're just, 
They're on all of them. As far as grouper and things like that, in terms of what you might see in Florida, we don't have out here near as many grouper aggregations like that, so we're just not seeing that. I don't know that it doesn't exist, but they're not as, you know, what you see when you go down are gray snapper, obviously a lot of look downs and things, but red snapper, what's right there kind of in your face. And they're, they're spawning lo just locally there. Will there be any attempt to look at um, platforms and other structures in aggregation rather than individually? It might be that for things that are somewhat migratory or that have different needs in different stages of their life cycle, that the ability to get from point A to point B without having to go too far uh, may be important. So um, I wondered if there was going to be an aspect of this that looked at how far away from the nearest other reef or hard structure a, we, a platform was. You, for, we're using red snapper as a model species. We're looking at that very dispersal with our acoustic network. So, we, so in other words, how far are they willing to risk predation to move to the next reef? Obviously, hurricanes and weather events and things can distribute them. But in general, what we're seeing is they're very, very site specific. They stay put. In fact, years, the tags last three years, some of them stay, they never move. And, um, but that's a very good question because not only, things fly too, like birds that use them as well as migratory routes. So this connectivity issue is, is just as important for, for things above the water as below, but that's way down the line, unfortunately. We're just pretty much getting the, the basics out of the way right now. Yes. Um, have you made comparisons uh, between the reef structures and uh, the natural uh, reefs and banks as far as uh, biomass and uh, diversity? And yeah, and that's a great question because, believe it or not, there's been some evidence that, that, you know, for whatever reason, these, maybe because they're isolated, they attract a lot more than what a natural one would sometimes. It just depends. Um, that's exactly what we plan to do with Wes. So Wes will be out hitting many of the hard structures in our area. Right behind him will be out and simultaneously hitting, doing direct comparisons between natural and, and um, hard bottoms versus structured habitat. So that's top of our list. All right, <coughs> there's no other questions. That's Good, thank you very much. All right, sure. Okay, uh, we have a few minutes uh, until one. If everybody will gather back in the room uh, at one o'clock, we'll get started again. Thank you.